could we all stand for a moment? And uh, I would like to give honor to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you knew me before Jesus got a hold of me, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict. I was a, if you would see me on the streets, you say, forget about him. He is a lost cause. He, is, as a matter of fact, I can't tell you the times that I had to be picked up off the street, sometimes put in an ambulance and taken to the hospital because I was so inebriated. Then one day Jesus Christ got a hold of me. It is Jesus. I tell people it is Jesus. It's not religion. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Somebody helped me out. Somebody came and helped me. Wow. Is, what a beautiful thing to be able to help someone. What a beautiful thing to be helped by someone. <clears throat> I'm going to refer you to, I'd like to bring you to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 5. This is, there's five books in the law, the first five books in the Bible. They're called the Pentateuch, or, which means the first five books. It's the law. And every Jew knew about the law. Every priest, every Levite, everyone knew about the law. And this is in the book of Deuteronomy. And it says, could we read it together? Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. This is what Deuteronomy wants, well, the word of God wants us to know. That God is only one God. And we are to love that one God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might, everything. And then in Leviticus, which is the fourth book in the law, chapter 19, verse 18, could we read that together? Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the people, the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, I am the Lord. God is being specific. I'm the one that's talking to you here. Could we all pray and ask God to just anoint us here and, and just be with us? Lord Jesus, we love you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for your word, your spirit, and your truth, and your love toward us, your great love. Lord Jesus, bless your word today. Anoint us, Lord God, to hear from your word. Anoint us to speak your word. Anoint us, Lord Jesus, to see your word, Lord God, in action. Lord God, bless each and every one, Lord Jesus. And as we're seated, can we just give the Lord one hand of a praise? God bless you. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Uh, nearly 45 years ago, March 12th, 1970, my mother, father, and aunt and uncle brought me to the train station in Worcester. And while I was heading to the train station, they, uh, they were talking about different things, about what I was going to be entering into. And well, when they got to the train station, after hugs and kisses and a few tears, I boarded the train headed for Logan Airport in Boston, where I would be sworn in to the United States Armed Forces 
and become government property. Government property. So from Logan, we flew out to O'Hare in Chicago, then boarded a bus for Great Lakes Naval Training Center. We arrived around midnight, and they took roll call and started the indoctrination. Wow. It was a whole new way of life for me. I mean, big time. I was a tough guy. I was 18, 19 years old. I was tough. But boy, there were tears in my eyes that night. <laughs> Along with a lot of other young men that were over there. That first night, you could hear sobbing and, oh, Lord, what am I in for? What did I do? Now, instead of Dennis Busquette, son of Armin and Antoinette Busquette, I was seaman recruit Dennis Paul Busquette, serial number D11-1700. And you better not forget who you are. You better not forget who you are. Just in case you are stopped by a night watchman with a loaded M16 who says, Halt! Who goes there? Uh, 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 who am I? <laughs> Scares the living daylights out of you. <laughs> Why, has anyone ever heard that expression, halt, who goes there? I'm sure you have. <laughs> and, uh, in other words, stop. Who are you? We want to know who you are. So, uh, Seaman recruit Dennis Paul Busquette, uh, <laughs> serial number D11-1700. All right, come on. And uh, that was quite an experience. I would like to ask all of us that question this morning. Could we just stop for a moment? Could we just stop for a moment? Just stop and examine ourselves. Just look at yourself real good here. Stop. And find out, who are you? Who am I? Turn to your neighbor and ask this question. Do you know who you are? Do you? Really, do you know who you are? Do I know who I am? Well, male, Caucasian, well, I used to be six foot, about 5'11", I'm shrinking. Uh, and uh, I'm a husband, a father, a son, I'm not a holy trinity, I'm one, but I'm all of these. Do you think God could be that? Could be all of those and be one God? <clears throat> uh but that's not what I'm preaching about. I'm not going to go off on a rabbit trail this morning. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> well, I'd like to. <laughs> but God has given me something else here. <sighs> it's good to be a child of God. It's, it's an honor to be able to speak the words of eternal life. God has given us the words of eternal life. Is that something? Eternal life. Everlasting life. Whew. I wanted to know once about that, eternal life. In the early 80s, I went to a rally where they did a skit. Did anyone ever tell you that they would rather see the gospel than hear it? I believe that's true for a lot of people. Some people would rather see the gospel than hear it. I want to see the gospel in action. What is the gospel? And they've heard so much, it's coming out their ears. They're hearing everything from soup to nuts out there. Well, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that. Oh, you don't do that, don't do that over there, but you got to do this over here. You got Man, whew. I'd rather see 
the gospel sometimes than hear it. Is it a bunch of rules and regulations? You got to do this? You got to do that? So, <laughs> but when you see it for yourself, it leaves a lasting impact. It did on me. It did on me. I remember the minister that was preaching that night in the early 80s. I was at that rally. His name was Brother Enman, and he had come to New England to start a church in Hartford, Connecticut. A few years later, we shared a room at General Conference, and, and I t thanked him for that, that sermon and how it made a, a lasting impact in my life. It made such a lasting impact in my life that there were things that happened to me during those early years when I first became a Christian, that, and, I, and I heard these, these sermons, but when I saw it in action, it does something to you. And, and one time I was on my way home from work, and believe me, I'm not bragging on myself. I, I brag on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one I brag on. I, I'm nothing. He's everything. He's everything. And uh, I was working second shift, and I was on my way home, and I, it's around 1 o'clock in the morning. It's cold, rainy out. And all of a sudden, I see this figure coming out of the woods. And this young man is running out of the woods, and he comes out to the road, and he, and he puts his thumb out. So I said, man, it's cold, rainy out. It's getting... Normally, you say, oh, okay, hopefully somebody will pick him up. You know? But me, I picked him up. I, I pulled over, and I said, okay. I says, uh, where are you heading? And I, he says, I'm going to Webster, which is about, you know, maybe five or six miles out of my way you know, past my house where I was going to go home and go to sleep. I said, oh, I'll take you to Webster. Sure, no problem. Uh, so uh, we started driving down the road, and uh, I said, uh, whereabouts are you heading in Webster? This is about a mile after uh, uh, I passed my house. And uh, he said, uh, I don't know. I said, you don't know? No, he says, I, I got kicked out of my house by my stepfather. We had a fight. And uh, he says, do you think the police will let me stay at the police station? I says, you don't have a place to stay? He says, no, no. So I'm thinking, oh, man, I've been to the police station before, and I've been be in the slammer, you know, and it's a cold slab, a cold concrete slab. It's, it's not very comfortable. So I says, hey, I, I says, I got a, a spare bedroom with a, a spare bed. I says, would you like to stay at my house for the night? And he looked at me, his eyes got big. Yeah. So I turned around. And I don't know the kid, <laughs> you know. And I'm not saying anybody should do this, <laughs> you know, because you don't know who you're picking up. But God has given us a spirit of discernment and sometimes you know after talking to someone for a little while I can tell that if they're really I can tell sometimes <laughs> but I brought him home and uh, I showed him where the bed was and uh, I got to talk to him a little bit about what Jesus did to my life maybe that's why I wanted to get him in the house so I could preach at him <laughs> no maybe not I don't know but I was able to help him out. The next morning we made breakfast. And uh, he said, I do have a sister that lives in, uh, in Webster. And uh, so I brought him to his sister's house. And, and hopefully that stuck with him. It stuck with me to, to help someone, you know. But to see it a gospel, to see it for yourself, it's a powerful thing to see someone hurt. I once was driving down Main Street in Southbridge, and I was a young kid. I remember that. I was with my mother. I saw two guys on the sidewalk having a fist fight. You know, I mean, they were really slamming each other. And I said, "What in the world?" And <clears throat> but uh, that's not a nice thing to see. People hurting other people. And yet it happens all the time. People hurt people all the time. 
and I'm, I'm sure some of you have been, been hurt. But, uh, this here, <clears throat> I'm going to turn your attention to Luke chapter 10, verse 25, starting reading at verse 25. This is, uh, this is very interesting. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. You know, Jesus was always being tempted. You know, what about this? What about that? What about this? You know. But this guy, he seemed to be interested in this one question. Saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the next verse, Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? I'll read this. I'll see how Jesus turns it around. Now I'm going to ask you the question. You're the lawyer. You should know something about the law because you're a lawyer. <laughs> you're very, very smart. You read a lot and you know the law, right? So he says, how do you read it? How readest thou? And he, answering, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself, as thyself. Wow. So Jesus said to him, this is good. Thou hast answered right. You're a lawyer and you did it right. Not too many lawyers do it right. But he did it right. He says, you have, you, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And, being a lawyer, he wants to cross-examine. And he, willing to justify himself. Don't we want to justify ourselves sometimes? Well, I did this, and I did that, and I did, God, I did this, and this, that. Why aren't you doing this? But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Because being a lawyer, I'm sure he's helped out many people. And Jesus answering said, A certain man, a certain man, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And... This is the Jericho Road. It's Jerusalem's nice, beautiful, holy city. It's probably a Jew coming down here. And fell among thieves. Oh. <laughs> Who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Half dead. Ah, uh, ah, uh, and by chance there came down a certain priest. Thank God, everybody say thank God for priests. Oh, uh, they know the law, right? A certain priest that way, and he, when he saw him, he passed by. On the other side. Wow. The priest. Oh. And likewise, a Levite. A Levite are those that help the priests and do their temple duties. When he was at the place, came and looked on him. Well, he actually stopped and looked at him. And passed by on the other side. Samaritans I hated because they intermarry. Samaritans I hated by the Jews because they're like the scum of the earth. Dirt bags. They intermarried. They didn't stay in their religion. They married Gentiles. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, oh, Samaritan coming down the road, a dirt bag. Somebody that is hated 
The Jews won't even talk to Samaritans because they're hated. They're despised. They're dirtbags. Came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. Everyone say compassion. Compassion on him. And, oh, he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, which was two days' pay. Everyone say, two days' pay. And gave it to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, now this is a lawyer. He knows it. He knows it. He knows it. He didn't want to say the Samaritan. He said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go thou and do likewise. Amen. Can we give a hand to these uh, awesome reenactors? I've had training from different sources and things that people said from different religions try to influence my thoughts and my feelings. Whatever you see and whatever you hear has an influence upon you. Uh, the things that people say and the actions that people do have an influence on you. That's why people are being fed so much junk over the airwaves. That's why the devil is called the prince in the power of the air. So he does something where something is coming over the airwaves that <clears throat> affect your thinking. And actually put a lot of fear in people's lives. I like it when the newscasters, when something happens... Oh, we're getting an inch of snow. Better get ready. Better stock up your shelves. Uh, you know, come on, there's a storm coming. Fear. Fear. Something bad's going to happen here. But Jesus, when he came, and this is the amazing thing about Jesus. He came. And his mercy, like Bob was saying, and what was read, his mercy endureth forever. Forever. Forever and ever and ever. What in the world? So, stop for a minute, and let's examine who we are. When I'm doing research for this, sermon <laughs> so many things come into your head and your mind when you, and you say whoa what is that and something happened to me and, and I stepped back and I said whoa that's different I never thought of it that way okay <clears throat> when Jesus was speaking to people he says I am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness the Jews hated that. And the Pharisees said, oh, you're speaking, you're, you're giving testimony of yourself. Your testimony is not true. And he says, I am the one that sent me and the one that sent me. We're the ones that are testifying. And he, then he goes to say, and I love this because it's so true. And the word is so powerful. The Bible says, even... It says the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Jesus said, 
if you don't believe I am the one that I say that I am, okay? If you don't believe that I am he, you shall what? Die in your sins. And you look at that and you say, what they said, who are you? And he says, even the same that I've been telling you about from the very beginning. And it says, they understood not that he was speaking about the Father. Jesus Christ was Jehovah God in a human body. He was Almighty God in a human body. That's what he was. God manifest in the flesh. God was completely and totally revealed in a human body. And yet God fills all known expanse. He's everywhere. He's our Father. He's our Savior. He's our Redeemer. He's our Deliverer. He's our Healer. <clears throat> so, who are you? Are you the traveler that is traveling down the road and someone has beaten you up and left you a mess? Are you on, on, on the side of the road right now? Are you bloody and you're waiting for someone to come and bandage you up and pour in oil and wine? You know? Or are, are you the good Samaritan pouring on the oil and wine to help bandage someone up that is bruised and beaten? I... Jesus, this is what I, I found that started my mind thinking. I said, wait a minute. A Samaritan has a Jew for one of his parents and a non-Jew for another one of his parents. Right? That's what a Samaritan is. And it's despised. Jesus was a Jew, right? But was he something other than a Jew? He, his mother was a Jew, but was his father a Jew? No. Jesus is the good Samaritan that pours the oil and wine on us to heal us. The oil signifies the Spirit of God to heal us and deliver us, and set us free, and give us the victory, and heal those broken, broken, he says, I come to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus is my good Samaritan. Oh, hallelujah. I hope somebody gets a hold of this. Jesus is here to heal. He's here to deliver. He's here to pour the Holy Ghost on us. It's the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, being poured into our vessel that delivers and heals and sets us free. Oh, hallelujah. You can't do it. He does it. You don't want to take any credit for this. Jesus, what you see here is the result of Jesus Christ coming into a life, right? That was someone that was, couldn't deliver himself. I mean, there is something to say about willpower. There's no doubt about that. There is that. People have a definite willpower. God has put that within each and every man to have that willpower to do something, to go somewhere. Willpower is your will saying, okay, I'm going this way. <clears throat> and it helps people to have that. And when you get together with someone else, it helps. Willpower is powerful. But it's not as powerful as the Holy Ghost. It's not. It's not as powerful. If you get a hold of this, and some people have come and have listened and have gone their way, but some people have said, I want this. I, Jesus, I want you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory, that delivers and heals and sets you free. Ah, <laughs> I'm living proof. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> so, Jesus is the good Samaritan. And he wants us to be filled with his spirit so that 
we can be good Samaritans. We can be like Jesus. We can bind up wounds. We can pour in oil. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, one thing that I have done in my life is I tried to be honest and truthful with people. And I'm not perfect. I am not perfect. Mm -mm. But I still bring the truth. I try to bring the truth into people's lives. And boy, oh boy, is the Bible come alive when you become a spirit-filled Christian. The Bible comes alive to you and you see, okay, there are scoffers out there. Oh yeah, that scoff at you, scoff at God, scoff at this, do horrible things, say horrible things. Oh yeah. But there are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you know what? Those are the ones that are blessed. He says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Those are the ones that are going to be filled. I had relatives come to church and sit in a, in a service. And, oh, one, one time one of my close relatives was just started to weep. And I said, oh, man, God's getting a hold of him. But then when the altar call was given, he just walked out the other door. I said, what's going on here? I thought God was getting a hold of him. Well, he was sad that with the message was saying, okay, this is the way you are. And he knew he was not going to make it. So he was crying about that, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, because he went on living the way he was living. And Lord knows, I pray for him all the time. He, uh, and he knows the truth. And he knows it. People that come into this place, they know the truth. It's one thing to have head knowledge about it, but it's another thing to grab a hold of this and go with it. A little, in a few minutes, we're going to have an altar call. And the altar call is something that I look forward to in a church service. Because at the altar, I bring my, this vessel to the Lord. And I say, Lord, fill it up. Fill it up. Fill me up with your spirit. Your oil is significant of the Holy Ghost. It signifies the Holy Ghost. It is. And you, we all read, well, many of us read about the ten virgins. Jesus said five were wise and five were foolish. The foolish went out to meet the bridegroom, but they had no oil. They took no oil in their lamps, in their vessels. The wise took oil in their vessels. Okay? And at midnight, a cry went out, the bridegroom cometh. <clears throat> and the wise, well, all, all the virgins trimmed their lamp, their lamps. And, but the wise had that oil that kept the vessel burning brightly. Like, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Keep that vessel full of oil, and you will burn brightly. I'm telling you, people see you walking into the store and say, okay, there's something about that person. I remember going to a store with Susan, and there was, she was looking at something, at a card rack or something, and someone was standing behind her, and she knew someone was standing behind her, and, and he wasn't moving, and uh, finally she turns and looks at him, and he says, excuse me, he says, are you a Christian? And what would, what would make someone ask her that? What would, there must have been a light shining there. <laughs> Women have that exceptional thing that can make them shine brightly. <laughs> but uh, we all are told by Jesus, let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Lord Jesus, and how can you burn brightly without any oil in your vessel? The foolish version says, give us some of your oil. Give me, give me some of your Holy Ghost. How can he give me some of his Holy Ghost? He could pray. For, he says, go and buy some. You know, I, I can't give you this unless there's not enough for me. You know, I want to be saved. I know the bridegroom's coming. I want to make it. 
I don't know about you, I can't work out your salvation, but I can come and get my vessel filled with oil on an altar. Lord Jesus, fill me to overflowing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We can do that. We can do that. You can get your vessel full of oil. And boy, what a difference it makes in your life and other people's lives. Oh, you better believe it. When I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I don't know, 35, 36 years ago. Well, actually, 37 years ago now. <laughs> 37 years ago. It's amazing how many people come into a place where God is just wooing them. He says, come to me. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll do it. Come. It's like, oh. I can feel sometimes, I can feel pleading with people. Please come to me. I want to give you rest. I want to heal you. I want to deliver you. I want to set you free. I want to give you the victory. Oh, yes. And I want to walk hand in hand with you on the streets of gold. Lord Jesus. And I was, the night I got the Holy Ghost, all hell broke loose against me. <clears throat> and my friends and close relatives, uh, they would just, you go there and you're gone, you know. And I says, I got to do, I got to go, I got to check this out. I didn't know I was going to get the Holy Ghost that night. I think the devils knew, <laughs> boy, because they come out against me, you know. But anyway, I went with my, my friend, my drinking buddy, my pal, who was so against me going to church. He was so against it. Why are you so against me going? If I was going to some other church where the Holy Ghost is not poured out, you better believe. He said, yeah, no problem. Yeah, right. But if God's going to come into your life and make a difference in your life, mm -hmm. the enemy doesn't want that. Because you know why? Because you're going to be a light to shine on others and bring others to Jesus Christ. You're going to be a light that shines in the darkness. And I'm telling you what, this world is getting darker. And the darker the night, the brighter the light. Praise God. Glory to God. I like that saying. But... <laughs> When I was invited, I was listening. I was hungry for God. That's why he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be full. I was hungry for God. I wanted a change in my life. I was tired of being picked up on the side of the road and thrown into an ambulance and taken to a hospital. I was tired of the drunken fits. I was tired of looking at my eyes every morning in the, in the mirror, bloodshot, and my head swollen and from fights or different things that happened in my life. I was tired. I was tired of being lied to. Oh, yes, I was tired of being lied to because Jesus comes along and says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You got chains on you? You want to be free? The truth will make you free. It will. You better believe it will. You, oh, yes, it will. It, it set me free. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And when that, oh, Brother Gooding, I'll never forget his name. He was about my age back then, about 37 years ago. He's probably gone on to be with the Lord right now. But he said, whoever wants the Holy Ghost, come to the altar. And I stepped out of my seat. And Morris, my good drinking buddy, stepped out of his seat. We were sitting right next to me. And I said, oh, wow, Morris is going to come and get the Holy Ghost too, right? But Morris... When we started walking down the aisle, there was an exit door on the side, and he ran out that exit door. What in the world? What's going on? I was running to the altar. I want this. I want Jesus inside of me. You know what? Either Jesus is going to be the Lord of your life, or you are. You are. Do you want to be the Lord of your life? Is it really doing you good? Is really helping you, being the Lord of your life, if you're the Lord. I saw this circle once, that somebody illustrated it, and there was a throne in a circle. Okay? And either you were sitting on a throne, or Jesus was sitting on a throne. It was two, 
two illustrations. And when you're sitting on the throne, everything in your life is a mess. Your relations, your home, your things, everything's a mess. Everything. When you're sitting on the throne. Well, when Jesus was sitting on the throne and you're at his feet, everything is beautiful order. Amazing. Amazing. Jesus wants to set our lives in order. He wants to give us a beautiful life here and eternal life with him forever. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So who are you? Who are you? Who am I? Ask your neighbor that again. Who are you? Go ahead. Mm. I can tell you who you are. Yep. When Jesus comes into your life and fills you with his spirit, uh, the oil starts working and it starts to heal. Sometimes it's not overnight. Sometimes it takes a little while. Healing takes time. Sometimes it takes time. But you keep on coming and taking that oil. You keep on getting your vessel filled with that oil. And oh, what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful, beautiful thing it will be. <clears throat> so Peter had an idea of what we were or what we are. <clears throat> Do you know that a priest is someone that works in the temple and he actually brings sacrifices to God for the people and he brings people to God and he also brings God to people. A priest is a powerful thing. And being a priest, wow, what a beautiful responsibility it is. I want to be a priest. I do. Not someone that goes around with a robe on and says, okay, bow to me or anything like that. Because mm -mm. there was a time when the apostles were arguing <laughs> with each other. Imagine that. Argue. Who's the greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? Am I going to be the greatest? You're going to be the greatest. You're going to be the greatest, right? You're going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Let's argue about who's going to be. I think I'll be greater. What do you think? Do you think you're going to be greater than me? You know? That's what they're arguing about. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Imagine that. The apostles of the Lord arguing with each other. Who's going to be the greatest? What in the world? <laughs> Jesus heard them arguing. He said, I'll tell you who's going to be the greatest. One that's a servant. That's what you become. A servant. A servant of God and of others. To love others and take care of others. And to love God with all your heart. It's a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing to come to prayer. On Thursday, I'm going to put in that, that little bit here. Yeah, to come to prayer. Because something happens in prayer. It's very powerful. Where you're talking to God. You're talking to the Lord. Lord Jesus. When I come home and I see Susan, she's my bride. <clears throat> if I say, hi Susan, how you doing honey? And she doesn't talk to me. I say, uh oh. <laughs> what did I do now? <laughs> you know? Uh, is everything all right, honey? Well, you're still not talking to me. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Okay, okay. Good. <laughs> it's good. It's a good thing for the bride to talk to the bridegroom. It makes the bridegroom feel pretty special. It does. Prayer is so beautiful. It's so special. When you say, Jesus, I love you. You know, we, <laughs> before I do this altar call, we do have an enemy that wants to say to you, you're not who you think you are, or you're a dirtbag. You're no good. Look what you did. You failed God here. You failed God there. You failed God there. You failed God there. And then you go to God and say, Lord, I'm such a miserable failure. 
oh man you know i failed you the other day over there he says what what are you talking about what are you talking about i don't see any failures over here is that something you already prayed about because when you pray and ask god for forgiveness he puts that in the sea of forgetfulness he doesn't remember it the devil wants you to remember your failures oh yeah he does because that way, <laughs> you're not going to let your light shine. Mm, hallelujah. I hope somebody's getting a hold of this. I, I don't know. This, this old. <laughs> you are the light of the world. What did Peter have to say about you? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. This is what Peter says. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That means you're special. You are special people. Yes, you are. Oh, yes, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. Out of darkness, I was in gross darkness. People out there are in gross darkness. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, they are. Oh, but you are the light of the world. Mm. He called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's his light. It's his light. It's not your light. But you become the light of the world because it's him in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Which in time past were not a people. Right? But are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, Whew. but now have obtained. That means gotten a whole, I've obtained it. I've gotten it onto myself. I got God's mercy on me. I got it wrapped around me. His loving kindness and His mercy. Oh, yes, thank God for the Holy Ghost, because when I fail, oh, yes, I, I love Holy Ghost conviction. It's your best friend. It brings you to a place, say, Jesus, I dropped the ball. It, oh, please forgive me. So, okay, my son, my daughter, come on up. I love you, and he wraps his loving arms around you. Don't let the devil tell you you're a failure. He's a failure. Oh, yes. The de devil backslid before there was a devil. Talk about a failure. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yes, he did. He fell. He fell. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning out of heaven. He fell. Oh, yes. Mm. That pride of life wants to get a hold. And the devil wants to heap it on you. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. And when you do look at that, he says, oh, you miserable failure. You look at that. Uh, tell the devil to shut up. Tell the devil to shut up and get out of your life. Jesus said to do it many times. He said, Satan, get behind me. Get behind me. Get lost. I I'm going this way. You're going that way. Mm. I'm going this way. Hallelujah. 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 Could we all stand? This is something here that I love. <clears throat> I'm going to have the praise singers come up and sing praises unto God while everyone that wants to get their vessels filled with oil, come on up. If you don't want your vessel filled with oil, you don't have to. That's right. But if you want Jesus to fill you with oil, come on up and get filled with oil because he's here to fill you up. Lord Jesus, we love you tonight.